child slave operator. Well, what, what the Bolsheviks did is when the Jewish capitalist workers were on strike, I'll, I'll talk loud enough so you can hear me. No, it's, uh, we're, we've got a question time. Just wait a second, I don't hear it. Norma, please. <laughs> I forgot to factor this in, I want to do it. When the Jewish capitalist Christian workers were on strike, the Bolsheviks supported that strike. If the Black Hundreds, which were the Ku Klux Klan of Russia, found out about it, they went to police stations and ran off pogromist literature to murder this Jewish capitalist and his family, then the Bolshevik would form armed defense guards and knock some workers' heads in till they realized that what would happen if they went along with the Black Hundreds is the Tsar would send in troops to stop the riot and destroy the strike. So if you wanted to win the strike, you had to not single out an oppressed national minority capitalist for extermination. So that's the policy I would use. Okay, even though, so even if Leo Frank was everything that they said he was, which I doubt, he still, by a Bolshevik operation, would be defended from being killed as a member of a national press minority. Okay, so question answer period. It's a couple of things. One is I'm going to put this up on YouTube. The channel is NPML. That's where it's going to go. And if you give me your email, some of your emails I have, I will certainly send them the links, but others whose I don't have, if you want to give it to me, I'll, when I put it up, I'll send you. Uh, so, yeah, you can take a piece of paper and uh, uh, somebody has a piece of paper, then that's circulated. Can you take care of that, please? Uh, so, what we're going to do is everybody asks a question, uh, and I'm going to start with the front row. It's a two minute uh, uh, question or comment, and we'll go by rows. And, uh, uh, the, I would ask the panelists to keep it brief so that we can finish with everybody because quite a few people came. In your honor, Elazar, so, so you've got a good uh, turnout here. I got a what? You've got a good turnout, so keep answers brief. Questions are limited to two minutes. And somebody can can they keep time, please? Okay. Okay. No, I can't keep time. Somebody no, Gene, can you keep can you time or? Can you use somebody with a clock? Or? Okay. I also have a microphone for the people to use. Um, uh, one that makes a sound would be better. Uh, yeah, the one with the sound, this is one with the sound that is turned on. And uh, if anybody wants to use it, can use it. If they're not loud enough, I can't record it. It's making a little buzz right now. I mean. Well, it's. Because. Yeah. I will notify you when you have 30 seconds left and when you're finished. Two minutes. Yeah, please encourage people, please use the mic. Can you hear that, Rod? Use the mic. Please use the mic so that it records clearly. Even though people can hear it here, but you need to If you mark it, then when people watch it, they can hear okay. the questions and the comments. Otherwise, we have an a mic trained electrical engineer at at the controls, yeah, so right um, Are we ready to roll? I'm not Here as qualified. In, in okay, so I'll start with Gigi. Okay. Um, You're the first. A couple things. One thing I could um, use the mic. It's right there at the corner. Behind you. Behind Speak you. loudly. One thing is, um, I'm sorry to say it, but um, Alizar, I, I think I'm pretty good at a lot of history, but. I didn't understand your presentation. I couldn't follow it. Too many names and too many not saying if they were black or if they were white or if, I, I don't know. I didn't understand it. Sorry. Sorry. I understood Sue, Gerald. Uh, Gerald. Anyway, sorry Thanks to say that. Maybe us. other people probably felt different than I did. That's how I felt. One thing I wanted to say about um, pe people say Jews a lot and don't mention Zionists, and I'm sorry. Zionists are the friggin' enemy. They're Nazis to me. Jews are different, and I, I'm Jewish. And my family, during uh, uh, the 60s, I, I went, I mean, 59, my family went across uh, the country in visiting our, our relatives and so on. And they were all like in favor of uh, Martin Luther King, and they were all like very good people. They were not, they were not bosses and stuff. Well, I mean, I know there were bosses too, but, and, and whatever, I, I just, I agree with what he said about that. But I just think people need to 
say this. It's not said on news. It's not said anywhere. Zionism is really bad. It's, it's, to me, they're as bad as Hitler. Look what they're doing to the, to the Palestinians. It's terrible. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Norma, please. Just so you know, my folks brought home an issue, uh, a book called We Charge Genocide. And I was about nine. Something like that. By William Patterson. No. He yes. was. I think it was a collective effort. He was. Eric? Yes. Uh, Gerald, did you also want to include P.D. Perez? You're part of that committee? Correct. Um, I wonder if, I, don't, I really don't want to give my opinion, but I would like to, for the two of you to talk more. Uh, what do you think, uh, what are the kinds of things that the two of you are doing uh, to combat this racism and anti-Semitism? <coughs> And what are the kinds of things that you think are doable for others? <laughs> That's all. Do you want to take the question, or do you want to? Do we want to keep well, going? Well, I think two or three at two a time. Course, two or three. So then, go ahead. You're next. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm getting blinded by the light. I remember my uh, one one of my encounters with Nation of Islam people. Uh, it was a young man, he was standing in front of the MacArthur bar selling a uh, burning spear. And uh, I, as a white girl, <coughs> asked him what this is about. And he started telling me how Jews invaded, invented slavery. Hmm. Jews brought blacks to this country and invented slavery. Help me, Lord. Um, okay, that's... Um, that's as much as I needed to know about Nation of Islam. Um, on the, I did want to say there is a difference between nationalism and national liberation. And this is something that Franz Fanon was very clear about. There is a sense in which a people want to be identified as a people and accept that identity and promote it as part of who they are. Zionism arose specifically in Poland by Jews who were refused an identity and who wanted to be proud of being Jewish. It was not uh, initially a uh, reactionary movement. It was a movement for liberation of the oppressed Jews in Poland, although Poland didn't exist at the time. Okay. So, 30 seconds when, left. Okay, when it came to how it was transformed by Israel, it became narrow nationalism. Narrow nationalism, just like Nazis, is national socialism, just like any other narrow nationalism in Serbia in Syria, in India, every narrow nationalism is, is counter-revolutionary. I wanted to talk about something else, but I guess my time is up. Yeah, yeah. Time is up. No, no. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'd like to try to respond to some of the things. Uh, I, Zionism is not the same as Nazism. Not, though the Zionists, before the state of Israel, collaborated with the Nazis in a very precise way in the transfer agreements. And we can elaborate that if you wish. And uh, the Zionist movement was split between so-called labor Zionists and revisionist fascist Zionists. And not that both of them didn't do criminal things against the Palestinian people, but uh, you can't equate Nazism, which is a weapon of monopoly capitalism and crisis to crush the working class, exterminate the Communist Party, uh, destroy the working class movements entirely, with Zionism. Now, doesn't mean that Zionism doesn't share aspects of that, but I do not equate it. And I do not believe that the Zionists, there's a Zionist occupation government in the United States. But I do believe that Israel is a junior partner of American imperialism, carrying out hideous acts like training the death squads in El Salvador, Guatemala, Argentina, causing the death of hundreds of thousands, and supporting Somoza, and on and on and on. There are people here that know more about this than I do, yeah. like my friend Ralph. And then, 
in terms of what you say, Gerald does much more than I do. When I was here, he called me a one day a week revolutionary. I'd say it's more like one day by monthly revolutionary. Now, I'm trying to work with DSA in Idaho. They are doing their got bad politics from my point of view, but they're young people and they are doing some things. In terms of what Ursula said, uh, I don't know if I can recap it, but uh, the Israeli, the Palestinian Communist Party, part of it came out of the uh, group called Pole Sion, small, the left Pole Sion. Some say they were tainted with a little bit of soft Zionism, some say no. Uh, Musa Boudieri's history of the Palestinian Communist Party deals with that in a very precise way. I think how we fight Zionism is crucial. Just the way how you fight a blood-sucking Jewish capitalist in a non-Nazi, non-racist form in a revolutionary manner takes a different discipline. And I think the Bolsheviks have the right program on it. Uh, okay. Gerald, Thank you. So, yeah. Let me, let me just let me just say this really, really quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. I got yeah. this. We'll and give that this. Is, use that microphone next yeah. time. Yeah. In terms of combating yeah. racism and anti-Semitism, I want you to know something, brothers and sisters. As long as you breathe it and you're alive, you can you still fight the power on this stuff. One, we're doing it right this minute, and don't don't take it for granted. What's necessary? unfortunately, is something that we don't have. And that is we need a party of the working class that can educate the class and lead the class into struggle. In fact, it is a known fact that insofar as the working class is on the march and is feeling its power and strength, you know, on the road to revolution, prejudices tend to melt. Oh yeah, people start feeling different and thinking different when they're now, in periods of reaction, up jump the devil. You get all this crazy anti-Semitism stuff. And I'm gonna tell you, it's becoming clearer in this country. If you wanna see it, look at that thing with those young Democrats that call themselves the squad. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. And it shows how people really feel and think and you know how this comes up. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. Well, all right, I'm sorry. The murder of innocent people in this synagogue by a fascist in Pittsburgh holds all kinds of educational opportunities for us. And when I say us, I'm talking about the workers' movement in the left. So that, that I just, I wanted to try to answer, you know, your question with that for now, uh, my time. Ron, uh, Ron is the next. Uh, so I will ask the app panelists to keep your remarks brief so we can get through everything. I got you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the presentation. It's the, the depth and the concreteness of, with which you present all these different uh, aspects of the questions. It really makes you one think. And what, I, what really piqued my interest some more, and I've heard a, a, a little about, that maybe you can elaborate on, is the, uh, the evolution of Watson and the populist movement. How could, you know, we get a small wreath from Debs and <laughs> a big one from the Klan, and what was, what was that transformation, and what does that signal about, what, how can that help us today in thinking about white working class and, uh, this um, reactionary populism that, that sucked into it. Well, on the subject of the relationship of Zionism to Judaism, I would like to refer people to the word of my and I. Speak written. a little louder, please, sir. I would like to refer Turn people to the book that my and I have written called The Hidden History of Zionism and the series of documentations that flow from that which explores the class character of the Zionist movement of the, the old bourgeoisie making common cause with the, uh, with the uh, ruling class in, in, in Russia, seeking to offer their services as instruments of that, of that control. And the delineation of how they proceeded is very, very precise and well known and established. I won't go into it now because I think people are familiar with it, but I will refer people to the work if they haven't seen it and encourage them to look at it. 
Thank you. What's the name of it? The Hidden, Hidden History of Zionism. Okay, everybody said it. I don't know what anybody said. The Hidden History of Zionism. The Hidden History of Zionism. No, I... I Right, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Um, I'm, Speak uh, into the mic. Is the mic on? Hi. Yes. Uh, I really appreciate the presentations, and I'm my mind is uh, swirling about what to say and what to ask. And I just I have a couple of points, and that is um, one. Um, I want to know if Irving, the guy who we saw his face there, if he was a member of the of the Nazi Party. No. Uh, and uh, the other thing I want to just share something I spoke briefly to my mother today who's 95 years old raised in a, in a Zionist family when most Jews were not Zionists and Orthodox and she said to me oh she was a mere 80 about 15 years ago she said it's just unsolicited from me she said it's sad that most Jews in this country seem to derive their Jewish identities as a vicarious relationship with Israel I said well how should Jews uh, establish or put forward their identities just well one based on justice of course sure Speak into the mic. We want to hear you. Oh, just I was tapping on the mic anyway. What? What? I wanted to make a comment. When you're you talking to the last one, I'm right on the back of this. With reference to Zionism and what we said earlier, Elon Pape, the Jewish anti Zionist historian, put it well, he said, it may have been a nationalist movement, but the minute it stepped foot right. on another people's land, it became a settler colonialist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that says a lot. And I have a specific question about the nation of Islam. Uh, I'm wondering if you know what their sources of revenue are, because sometimes that reveals a lot, too. Is it just... Um, congregation or well that's my question if you know the sources okay you want to ask take this uh, questions and answer these Good. Are you ready? yeah I just want to make a few comments uh, in terms of Zionism since it's going to come up uh, they murdered our laws are off the head of sock notes it was the right wing Zionist as I said before the labor Zionists developed all the way up to Christa, even after Kristallnacht, which is where 40,000 Jewish shops were broken into and lynching took place on the street. Is this thing on? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me now? The volume is much too low. No, you got to speak. Okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yes. So the, 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 the Havara, the transfer agreements between the Nazis and the labor Zionists, they struck a memorial medal, put a swastika on one side and a Jewish flag on the other side. Uh, Eichmann, one of the authors of the Hungarian Genocide and others, and Lieutenant Hagen went, invited by the Sochnu, to the Yishuv. The Yishuv is a Jewish settlement in Palestine before the partition of the state. Okay, And they dealt with the with, with uh, assigned uh, high-level Haganah officers, Fievel Holkus. The British kicked them out as Nazi spies. Bible Focus was assigned to go to Cairo and meet with them in Cafe Grappe, continue the negotiations with the Nazis. As far as we know, he betrayed the location of a resistance radio that was being run on a flatbed car along the border, making it difficult for the Nazis to triangulate and help them find that. His, his archives are still not fully opened by the State of Israel. Tom Segev says that he was a Nazi agent. I doubt it. I think that's his cover-up saying how deep in bed the Zionists were in the Nazis. So the, in the United States, there was an anti-Nazi boycott organized by the Jewish veterans, Louis Untermeyer. The organization that Leo Frank belonged to, B'nai B'rith, that formed the Anti-Defamation League that spied on the left and did all kinds of criminal acts, they opposed the anti-Nazi boycott, so did the American Jewish Committee. 
and even the American Jewish Congress wavered. Eventually they came on board. So, but in Palestine, Nazi ships with swastikas on it brought goods that were taken from the Jewish capitalists that invested in the Havara and resold in Palestine mm. for money. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. okay. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Hold on one second, Ross. Let me okay. just Sorry. very quickly pass it to the audience. No, 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 sure. <laughs> invented <laughs> slavery they're, they're, stuff. They're we have to stop acting, you know, mock outrage. Oh, how could they say that? How could they say virgin birth? How could they say walking on water? How could they say any of the dumb shit? I'm, I'm sorry. The um, misinformed things that these religions, you know, say. It's called a leap of faith. Because you get people to believe that, they'll believe anything. Okay? In fact, uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad said the world was going to come to an end in 1975. I swear to God, I never will forget that. And then, but people didn't leave. Okay, 75 come, I say, okay. I'm still breathing, we're still here, you know. That's the nature of religion. Part of it, so so when they say, you know, Jews in Venezuela, there are probably a small number of Jews that were involved in slavery early on. We don't have to deny that. But to say the Jews invented, we don't take that type of rubbish seriously. Well, where does it come from? The fact that the nation of Islam, nationalists generally, and others, they don't have a program for liberation of the very people that embrace their organization. Therefore, what do they give people? It's called the politics of resentment. That's why we need a workers' party, because at bottom, at bottom, it comes down to your program to change the economic and social fabric of society. And if you don't have that, you got to talk bullshit about Jews invented slavery and other foolishness, all right? Uh, Tom Watson is, is a neglected historical figure. Remember, what he didn't say is that the, the, the populace initially were organizing all farmers on a colorblind basis. Right. When I say colorblind, I mean they didn't see the special oppression of blacks and the role that that played, but they organized all farmers. They actually stopped lynchings. That's what, that's what Tom and the... And the the populace, they then, at, when they turned right, they turned hard and started participating in lynchings, which is one of the reasons that uh, black nationalists have always taken the position race first, because you can't, quote, trust the white man. And finally, uh, Nation of Islam sources of money, mostly their members, they don't, a very tiny amount from some reactionary Arab regimes, but they don't, it's not like, it's their members. Finish. Okay. That, Bring the mic. Yeah, the, the microphone is there. Oh, there's one. There's there. a third one. Yeah. Uh, you all right? Nina. Yeah. Uh, just lately, um, I've become concerned about what Trump said that uh, Jewish people have to be, um, um, how should I say, um, loyal to Israel or loyal to the United States. So it's a current issue that he's playing on quite a bit, and um, I'd like to comment on that. Yes, I heard it. I don't know how yet. Yeah, um, I would like to see a forum or sometimes a series of forums on the contradictory nature of Jewish history. Because, because the anti Semites, the Jew haters, you know, the racist Jew haters, have said all kinds of things and used everything they could dig up just to further their racism, doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of nasty stuff in Jewish history that people like me, for instance, who were raised Jewish, never even knew about. I, you know, I'm 78 years old, raised Jewish. I didn't know until a couple of years ago that the opium wars, business, the business end of the opium wars was 100% Jewish. That the people, the, the, the company, the, the, the company that, it is true, uh, it, it's undoubtedly true that the company run, led by, head by, headed by D David Sassoon uh, that, that ran the opium uh, trade into China in the, in the 19th century was only, they only had Jews in the company. They wouldn't let anybody else in it. So, I mean, we have to recognize there's a lot of nasty stuff in Jewish history that, that has to be uh, dealt with. I mean, it, Jewish history is very contradictory. The Jews fight against oppression, but Jews also playing a major role uh, in the oppression. 
We have to I'd like to respond to that. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. I'd like to respond to what Aaron said right away. May I do that, please? Yes, yes, of course. Go ahead. Uh, the Nation of Islam says that the Jews kick-started slavery. And in the beginning, they did play a big role. And we should not cover that up. Absolutely not. But also, uh, Jerry Klinger wrote an article, Jews for Slavery, Jews Against Slavery. I recommend people read that. Because there was a Jewish abolitionists. Of course, a people uh, are different. And I want to mention one thing in terms of black lynching in this country compared to Jewish oppression. In this country, Jews are privileged vis-a-vis -vis the oppression of black. But in Europe, Lenin said, if anything, the Jews were more. But 50,000 Jews were exterminated. This is before the Holocaust. 50,000 Jews were exterminated in pogroms, mainly in Eastern Europe, uh, mainly during the Civil War, because the white, the reactionaries fighting the Bolsheviks felt that they could divert away from revolution through Jew hatred. And that's a very important thing for us, that it not be used to destroy the revolution. Jewish babies were torn apart. There was nothing gentle about what happened. But the Jews in America, particularly in the South, had a different situation. So 3,000 Jews fought for the Confederacy. 9,000 Jews fought for the Union very and good. probably killed some of their brethren. And that's tough luck. I think that uh, woman at that mm. place, uh, Rich, yeah, that I take that woman. Okay, yeah, you have it, okay, but then come back to it. Okay, go ahead. I'd like to talk a little bit about the significance of the Frank case for habeas corpus, because that's the thing that it's usually cited for. The Leo Frank case is usually paired with another case called the Moore case, and that case involved a group of black defendants who were subject to mob violence and guard trials of between four to seven minutes. And uh, Justice Holmes, who was in dissent in the Frank case, later won in the Moore case and got the majority because Justice Brandeis had joined the court. Um, there are at least four major views on the Frank case, um, and you can divide them into conservative and liberal views. The major conservative view is held by a guy called Paul Bater. And uh, his view is that habeas corpus isn't a remedy that allows you to touch any constitutional rights. A uh, federal court can only look into whether a state court had jurisdiction. It's a very restrictive view of habeas corpus. Um, it relies on an early 19th century case called Watkins, in which Chief Justice Marshall said that habeas corpus is only a jurisdictional remedy. And uh, its supporters are the hangmen uh, on the Supreme Court, uh, Thomas, Scalia, and Rehnquist. Mm -hmm. um, two of those people were dead, but Thomas is now the leader of the conservative pro-death penalty faction on the Supreme Court. Um, it looks like Gorsuch will probably mm -hmm. join him. And uh, he's busy destroying habeas corpus uh, by developing the court's jurisprudence on EDPA, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. Um, the liberal view is, um, the main proponent of that view is a person called Gary Pella, and he holds to the view that was uh, advanced by Justice Brennan in an earlier case called uh, Fay versus Neuer. And uh, their main support is um, the Habeas Corpus Act of 1867, in which the uh, Reconstruction Humans. Congress... Can I have uh, additional time? Yes. No, no, please, yes. sorry. We, have, we don't have yes. enough yes. people. Well, let him finish his thought. Yeah, finish, yeah, finish yeah, wrap, wrap it up. Yeah. Okay, um, you know, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, basically, Justice Brennan's view has uh, been destroyed at this point. Right. And Brennan's view goes back, actually, to uh, probably the most important quote from the Frank case, um, in which Justice Holmes said, um, habeas corpus cuts through the form and gets to the very tissue of the matter. It comes in from outside, not in subordination to the proceedings. It must do this where it does nothing. And even though all the forms have been observed, it reopens the inquiry whether they have been nothing more than an empty shell. And that was quoted by Kennedy in De Medien, which is 
a case in which the communists actually won the right to habeas corpus for detainees at Guantanamo. Uh, that was one of the victories for uh, the left in recent years, one of the few victories. But to make things short, um, Brennan's view has basically been destroyed at this point, and the conservatives are in the ascendancy. Okay, Eliza wants Just to answer that. Reaction that more defense uh, defendants, Moore versus Dempsey, came out of what was called the Elaine massacres. Blacks tenants were being cheated by uh, the companies that they were trying to sell landlords and companies they were trying to sell their grain to. They formed a union, and out of this came the Elaine massacre of over 233 or 237 blacks, not only by lynch mobs but by the guard, National Guard called in to quell the riots. They shot him too. And then five people got killed, white people. So almost 250 blacks. So they put these 12 defendants, the Moore case, on trial and they were convicted for first degree murder. Then came what he mentioned, the Moore versus Dempsey thing where Justice Holmes' decision of a lynch mob atmosphere interfering with, with uh, proper defense, a proper fair trial, and using habeas corpus, one. Okay, that's it. Okay, we have only six minutes and six people still to ask questions. Keep it brief, please. Now, uh, just in, in regards to Gerald's talk, I, uh, um, my experience with the uh, Nation of Islam uh, was when I got involved with the Mario Woods Coalition. Uh, I was also, before that I was, I'm involved with the Oscar Grant Committee, uh, which thanks to Elazar who, who got me into the group with Gerald. And we were doing really good work. So when Marrier Woods was murdered, uh, the uh, Marrier Woods Coalition was created and I, I was going to meetings, it was about, like he said, 200 people. In the beginning, it was about 25% white people. And uh, Christopher Muhammad, he was a really awesome speaker. Uh, he really was a motivator, but in, all, in most all of his speeches, he would end up referring to Farrakhan. Farrakhan said this, Farrakhan said that. In the same way that, uh, you know, with Bob Abakian is the RCP, the Farrakhan and uh, Christopher Muhammad were to the Mario Woods Coalition. And I, being part of the Black Lives Matter, a lot of us were there for that, but became more of a, almost a recruitment organization for the nation that was Islam. And so the 50% the, the white people that were part of it went down to about 5% of the white people, and I was one of them. Okay, I did question Christopher Muhammad a couple times in a couple meetings, and after the meetings, their members, the Nation of Islam, came up to me to warn me not to question him too much to just come, you know, just be a good white person and follow, follow the program, whatever he says. And I, but I did question him and got in trouble. Uh, but there were other experiences. Thanks. Okay. I think there are two people on the left. <laughs> no, I mean, seated in the left. David is uh, not back yet. Thank you both for your presentation. We'll um, one thing I wanted to say, just a caution, a thing of warning about calling dividing Zionists and uh, Jews. I just think it's getting into bad, bad rhetoric in which we're separating and not questioning what we mean. Because the terms like any are changing. And um, we're alienate, going to alienate people because I think we all need an education present on what terms mean. I know Jews now who are um, calling themselves Zionists who are no long, not like the Zionists in the past because they want the preservation of Israel, but they're pro-Palestinian. I mean, so this is where I think we need to really kind of delve into education of what we mean now. Um, the, I have a question for Gerald. Um, Gerald, I was, when you were talking about initially the young people were coming into the Nation of Islam, all these young people who stood for what their values, what happened to them? I mean, during the suppression, you had talked about what happened to the Nation, Nation of Islam, kind of their agenda, but didn't these young people 
uh, fight back? What? What? Against the, whom, may I ask? The Nation of Islam. I mean, that's what I was wondering. Where where their voices were lost? What happened to them? Did they just acquiesce? Okay. Do you want to take one more question before you answer? Yes. No problem. Okay. One more question. Yeah. The person. Okay, in the back, all the way back. Okay. All right. So then, where is David? David is the one missing. David just went to the bathroom. Oh, okay. He's okay. He's okay. So that. Yeah. Okay. There is a question. I want to know if the.